Eliminate him. Kill him! She was must to scare the living daylights out of her. In 1987 saw the release of the 15th James Bond film, The Living Daylights, and the first to star Timothy Dalton as Bond. Upon its release, it received great feedback from the fans with its serious take on the James Bond character and attempts to stay faithful to the source material. Produced on a big budget for the time at around $40 million, it made nearly $200 million worldwide. The marketing campaign tried to bring across a darker side of Bond, with taglines like Dalton is dangerous, and the posters for the film were some of the best of the series. The images had beautiful artwork. Roger Moore had decided to retire as James Bond after seven films due to him being too old. I think fans at the time were expressing concerns that he should have maybe bowed out after five movies, but obviously the producers felt he was still in good shape to be Bond. Timothy Dalton had been approached in the late 60s to star in Her Majesty's Secret Service, but he felt he was too young for the role and declined. Come the late 80s, the producers were looking for a new James Bond and screen tested Sam Neill, who we all know from Jurassic Park. His screen test was well received, but Cubby Broccoli felt he wasn't right for the role. Piers Brosnan was chosen to be Bond, but due to him being contracted for a TV show in the States, he couldn't be freed from his contract. So the producers asked Dalton again, and he said yes. Timothy Dalton is a classically trained actor who mainly works in theatre, but has obviously done many films and TV shows. The film's title is taken from Ian Fleming's short story, The Living Daylights. It was the last film to use the title of an Ian Fleming story until the 2006 instalment, Casino Royale. The beginning of the film resembles the short story in which Bond acts as a counter-sniper to protect a Soviet defector, Yorgi Koshnov. During the mission, Bond notices that the KGB sniper assigned to prevent Koshnov's escape it's a female celloist from the orchestra. Disobeying his orders to kill the sniper, he instead shoots the rifle from her hands. Koshinov tells Bond that General Pushkin, head of the KGB, is systematically killing British and American agents. When Koshinov is seemingly snatched back, Bond follows him across Europe, Morocco and Afghanistan. The soundtrack to the film was the last one to be produced by John Barry, and he goes out with a bang, and composes easily his best work for the series. As soon as the film starts, he creates an epic gun battle rendition of the Bond theme. The score just sounds so grand and epic. During the ice chase sequence, he introduces sequenced electronic rhythm tracks overdubbed with the orchestra and creates a real modern sound for the time and has dated very well. The title song for the film, The Living Daylights, was co-written with Aha and recorded by them. The group and Barry did not collaborate well, resulting in two versions of the theme song. Barry's film mix is heard on the soundtrack and on AHA's later greatest hits album, Headlines and Deadlines. The version preferred by the band can be heard on the 1988 AHA album, Stay On These Roads. The title song at the time was one of the very few 007 title songs that is not performed, written by a British or American performer in the history of the series. There was also a music video produced, and it was directed by Steve Barron, who did AHA's Take On Me music video, and later went on to direct Ninja Turtles the movie. The video itself isn't that impressive as AHA's earlier work, but it's still an entertaining video. The film sees the return of the Aston Martin V8. This is definitely my favourite version of the Aston Martin. It still retains its classic look but looks more sleek. Hardcore fans will always love the car from Goldfinger, but this one will always be my favourite James Bond car. I was well pissed off when he blows it up. No Bond you fool, what are you doing? The special effects like most Bond films are very impressive. Loads of live action stunts and explosions. Great front projection work, especially in the chase sequence and during the sequence where Bond hangs out the rear of the plane. The effects team always made the right choice going with front projection instead of blue screen. As you can see, it blends well to the live action stunts. The miniatures are some of the best I think the Bond team has produced. The sequence on the bridge was actually a foreground miniature. The visual effects supervisor John Richardson explains. 
we needed a bridge that had to look as though it was over a terrifyingly high ravine. There is a modern bridge in Wazazat that goes over a stream bed. So uh, John Richardson and his uh, men built a what we call a foreground miniature. The bridge was four feet high, but looked as though it was a hundred. The background walls of the ravine were past work, and the rest of it all just sort of blended in with the real thing. Suddenly, this little wadi with a little bridge ten feet high was now 300 feet in the air, um, with all the cladding of the timber on it and everything else. The water um, in the bottom is, in fact, saran wrap on a painted piece of plywood. The whole thing became an absolute amazing shot and uh, it was one of the finest achievements that I've ever seen of foreground miniatures. I think it's one of those situations where you really can't see the, the join. And then back in Pinewood Studios, we built a quarter scale bridge over a little piece of river and real rocks. And then we literally blew that up and collapsed the bridge. During the late 80s, many video game publishers were starting to produce games based on new movies, and Living Daylights received a version on the Commodore 64, Amstrad, Spectrum and MSX, all produced by Domark, who had acquired the license at the time. As you can see, the graphics are nothing spectacular. What you have to bear in mind is over 20 years ago. The game wasn't that well received, unfortunately. US critics Siskel and Ebert both gave the film the thumbs down, and Ebert complained that Dalton's performance lacked humour, which I thought was a bit off. I think Dalton does display some subtle moments of humour in the film. I think US critics were wanting more humour and less of the serious approach, which was the opposite for what Bond fans wanted. By the time License to Kill came out, their opinions on Dalton had changed for the good. Our first movie is The Living Daylight with Timothy Dalton as the new James Bond. And I guess the question that people would like an answer to is what kind of a James Bond does he make? Well, I give him a mixed review. Timothy Dalton is a good actor. He is very convincing in the movie's more serious moments. He has a great screen presence. He looks interesting. But if he has a weakness, it's the comic side of the character. With Sean Connery and with Roger Moore, you always knew that they saw the humor in James Bond. And I've always thought of the series as basically sort of a put-on plus special effects anyway. So with Dalton looking for humor, I wasn't so sure. Look, for example, at this scene involving a new edition of Bond's famous Aston Martin. Sean Connery had a lot of fun with the original version of this car, but Dalton plays it a little bit straighter. What is this? I've had a few optional extras installed. That's Miriam Dabo there, a former model as the beautiful blonde. A lot of social observers have taken note of the fact that Bond, the old ladies' man, has a very conservative affair with just that one woman in this movie, unless, of course, you count the fact that in the pre-title <laughs> sequence, they always have a, at least one scene where Bond drops in on some beautiful woman unexpectedly. Maybe that lack of Bond's traditional promiscuity in this film reflects the fear of AIDS in our society. I don't know, but it puts a lot of responsibility on Mariam Diabo's shoulders as the only Bond woman in the whole movie. And after such legendary Bond girls as Ursula Andress, Maude Adams, Kim Basinger, and Britt Eklund, I frankly didn't find her very interesting. She just didn't seem to have the psychic weight to carry this role. She plays a Russian cello player who's innocently caught up in espionage, but the plot is never the point anyway in a Bond picture. It's just the relationships and the stunts, and my bottom line is the movie has great stunts, it has good special effects, it has a Bond who needs to work on a sense of humor, and it has a Bond girl who is not in the great tradition. And I, so I, uh, I should add thumbs, thumbs down. down. Me too, Roger. I was uh, disappointed in the film. I'm not as impressed, actually, with Dalton as you are. Uh, he's better than Roger Boer, but for me, that's not much of a compliment. He's nowhere near Connery was. He's, it's a classic figure. To me, he looked a little mousy. Uh, this Pierce Brosnan, <laughs> I saw him in a new film coming up, uh, Fourth Protocol. I think he might make a better Bond. He has more of the verve for life. This guy seems a little reticent. The other thing that you mentioned I think is very accurate about the Bond woman. She's not very appealing. And then the third point I'd like to make is all of the stunts that work are borrowed from the earlier films. The ticking clock down, remember how down to 007 in the original, they did it, the wheel, the spinning wheel. It's all taken from stuff before. They got nothing new here really, Roger, and that's well, why I'm it doesn't work. Well, I'm not sure exactly how much new you expected them to have at no. this point in the series. They've exhausted 
the entire life work you of got Ian it. Fleming and everybody else who could think of a plot. Exhausted. So I've, got, I've got to go back now and defend Timothy Dalton. Now, you mentioned Pierce Brosnan, who was also offered this yeah. role. Dalton, I think, does have a very good screen presence here. I think that he, he's the last thing I would describe him as is mousy. I he's, think that's a mousy, astonishing okay. thing for you to say. Well, I did it. I called James Bond a mouse, and I live to say it. The Timothy Dalton films are sometimes often forgotten by some people when discussing the series. As a kid, I only really saw the Roger Moore ones on TV and wasn't really aware of the Dalton films until my teenage years and was so surprised at the quality of the stories and Dalton as James Bond. It was great to see a serious take on the character and not have things played for laughs. Dalton's performance really shows a vulnerability to the character and really grounds him in reality. He doesn't come across as invincible. He shows moments of frustration and anger and he does seem short-tempered a lot of the time which is close to the Bond character. With people loving Daniel Craig's performance, it's funny how people forgot Dalton did the serious take years before, and many critics didn't like that. He was way ahead of his time, and it's a shame he only did two Bond flicks. Due to legal problems in the early 90s, it delayed any Bond production, and Dalton decided he didn't want to be Bond anymore. If there wasn't any legal issues, then there would have been one more Bond film with Dalton. He was contracted to do three movies. The director John Glenn holds the film together really well, and I think he's probably one of the best Bond directors, up there with Martin Campbell, who did Goldeneye and Casino Royale. The visual style is fantastic, and with great compositions and action set pieces, and all around good performances from the actors. The only thing I feel is not completely polished is the story, which can be a little complicated and overly drawn out in areas. The first 45 minutes are fantastic, then the movie kind of becomes something else. It's like they have two Bond scripts combined into one. The villains in the film are nothing really special, they are well cast, but the characters aren't strong enough and aren't as interesting as previous Bond villains. The Living Daylights is easily in the top 10 best Bond films. Every area of the production is to a high standard, but what makes the film awesome is Timothy Dalton, playing the role so seriously and showing more of a human side to Bond, and he even did a lot of his own stunts, so he really gave it his all. Now Daniel Craig is impressing audiences with his new serious hard edge version of Bond, and I think he has copied a lot from Dalton. But who is better? I'm going with Timothy Dalton. Comes the morning and the headlights fade away. Time to leave.